we present Vacant Possession by Nigel Banks. taxi driver appreciated our vocal talents. You speak the truth, Brother Mason. He was sure shooting, no connoisseur of good music. There you go, buddy. Well, I shouldn't really. I have to be up early in the morning. Oh, come on, Mason, you gotta. We should drink another toast to Lillian. <laughs> we gave her a good send off today, didn't we? Yes, Scott, we did. That was definitely the most entertaining funeral I've ever attended. Me too. I think Lillian would have approved. I'm sure she would. She always enjoyed a good comedy. <laughs> the hymn singing, for instance, was hilarious. I knew we were in for some fun when the funeral director told us the electric orchid was broken and we'd have to sing unaccompanied. I was late arriving, as you know, but I couldn't believe the caterwauling as I came through the door. <laughs> it didn't help that the vicar was tone deaf and had a voice like a foghorn. But then, the highlight was definitely your unscathed. Scheduled eulogy. I'll never forget the look on Andrew's face when he saw you striding to the front of the congregation. Had you planned it? No, far from it. I wasn't even supposed to be there. After our little altercation here last night, Andrew made it clear that I was persona non grata. But I thought, no way. She was my mother. For God's sake, he can't bar me from my own mother's funeral. I didn't have enough cash for a cab, so uh, I had to walk to the crematorium, uh, which is why I was late getting there. And, and then I see this priest standing there talking about Lillian as, as though they were best buddies. Well, I know for a fact she hated organized religion, couldn't abide it. So I thought someone should set the record straight. Someone who knew her. I'm sure Lillian would have been proud of you. I love that story of when you were a baby in a pram and she would put you out in the yard while she hung out the washing. How she used to swear out loud like a trooper. But realize she'd better curse her language because you'd started to copy the F word. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I have such vivid memories of her before she and my dad split up. She always seemed so full of life. It was like, she knew how to extract the maximum joy out of even the most ordinary thing. Like, say, eating an apple. She would bite into the flesh with such relish, as though she were tasting it for the first time and couldn't believe how delicious it was. And she had that distinctive laugh, deep and throaty. Yes, hadn't she? I can still picture her and my mum in fits of laughter about some scene from a film they'd seen at the cinema together. They'd often go to the pensioners' matinee on a Wednesday afternoon at the Empire. It's closed down now. If you want to see a film these days, you have to go to the multiplex in the Metro Centre. Multiplex? Metro Centre? Mason, you speak a language I do not comprehend. I've clearly been away from these shores too long. I'm going to need you as my interpreter while I get myself resettled. You're not going back to the States, then? No, the prodigal has returned. A little too late for the fatted calf treatment. And not exactly to the delight of my dear stepbrother. But still, I have a roof over my head. And my new good buddy Mason to feed me full English breakfast. Till I get this place fixed up. Ah, yes. Uh, you may need to talk to Andrew about that. Not unless I have to, after today's little show. If it hadn't been for you and that lawyer guy at the crematorium after the funeral, I think Andrew would have tried to punch my lights out. He was so mad at me for speaking out during the service. He never did like the comfortable order of things to be ruffled. 
Did you see the way he was eyeballing me across the room at the hotel? God, if looks could kill. Yes, you certainly won't be top of his Christmas card list. For sure. Anyway, he'll scuttle off back to St. Albans or wherever it is that he and the Mousy Maureen live. And I can get on with putting this place back to rights. Uh, there might just be a major problem with that idea. Splendid though it is, in theory. What's the problem? I come back to dear old England after my sojourn across the pond. I move into my late mother's house, which presumably passes to me as her only truly begotten son. Uh, if only it were that simple. As you weren't around at the time, Andrew had to apply for power of attorney when Lillian's dementia became so advanced that she clearly couldn't make decisions for herself anymore. Okay, I can buy that. So what does this power of attorney thing mean in practice? Well, there's the rub. Only a blood relative can be granted power of attorney, and as nobody knew how to contact you, the process had to go through the Court of Protection. It's the system these days, it's set up to prevent vulnerable folk being exploited by unscrupulous relatives. Hey, Mason, way to go! You know you're Shakespeare. There's the rub. And may I say, you speak the speech trippingly off the tongue. Horrible folk being exploited by unscrupulous relatives. I trust you are not including me in that category. Of course not. It's one of those catch-all measures that authorities put in place to protect a minority. Okay, so what's the situation here, then? The thing is, Lillian didn't leave a will. Andrew kept on dropping hints, but she was a bit coy about such matters. I think she was paranoid that he was after her money. Uh, not that she had much to leave. So she kept putting it off, and then eventually, of course, she wasn't in a fit state to make a will. Which means what? Well, in the normal way of things, it would mean that as Lillian died in testate, the only person who can inherit is a, a direct blood relative, which should be you. Andrew, kiss my ass. I wouldn't get too excited. It still all needs to be sorted out by the solicitor and social services, but I believe there's a strong possibility that this place will have to be sold to pay for Lillian's care while she was in the home. In the words of John McEnroe, you cannot be serious. I'm afraid so. It's not absolutely certain yet. I should make an appointment to see Alex Powell if I were you. He's the solicitor handling the case. You met him at the creme this afternoon. Nice chap. He'll talk you through the whole situation and advise you on the best course of action. And, of course, you're going to need to sit down with Andrew and discuss things. Oh, Peachy. I might have guessed my homecoming will be as difficult as my departure. Well, at least it has a certain symmetry to it, unlike the rest of my life. Perhaps the grass is greener back across the pond? Not from where I'm standing. No. I guess I'll just have to take my chance and see how things go with the house and Lillian's legacy. My gamble's become something of a habit with me. To tell you the truth, it's the real reason I'm here. Hello, Andrew. I thought you'd already gone back home. We're just leaving. Maureen's got a late shift at the hospital, and I've got an early start in the morning. It'll take us a good couple of hours, so we need to get on the road. If it were down to me, we'd have driven straight off from the hotel, but Maureen insisted I came to say goodbye. She takes a more Christian view of your performance today than me, I have to say. Hallelujah, Sister Maureen. It'd be too much to expect a civil word from you, especially when you're in your cups. I knew this would be a waste of time. Why don't you just sod off back to America where you belong? Believe me, I'd like nothing better. But the truth of the matter is, I can't. What's stopping you? I wouldn't get past immigration. Why not? Because I'm a wanted man. Wanted? What for? I was about to tell you when he came in. I somehow never got around to getting the proper immigration documents. After my tourist visa expired, I just sort of got used to living on the lam. 
If I ever hit a problem, I, I always seem to be able to talk my way out of it. Or slip the guy a bribe to look the other way while I made a run for the hills. But a few months back, I got rumbled, and my employer of the moment decided to run for Citizen of the Year by reporting me to the feds. So you came, scuttling back here, expecting us to welcome you with open arms? Now it all makes sense. You didn't turn up here because you wanted to make amends for the past, or because you missed your family. No, you just got caught out, and so you ran away. Same as you've always done. Well, there's nothing for you here now, so you might as well go back to America. The land of opportunity. Isn't that what you always used to call it? I told you, I can't. You accidentally got it right yesterday when you called me an undesirable alien. Even if I could get a tourist visa, I can't afford the airfare. I'm certainly not going to ask you to lend me the money, because I know what the answer would be. Too right. You seem to have spent your entire adult life living out a fantasy, chasing the American dream. And what have you got to show for it? I may not be as bright as you, but at least I've achieved something tangible. Steady job, happily married with kids, and a proper home. What have you got? Tales of adventure and a pocket full of dreams. I hate to admit it, but you're right. Seeing the sun go down over the Grand Canyon or sailing down to the Mississippi Delta doesn't count for very much now. Memories like that won't put food in my belly. Ha! At last! A reality check! You know, the thing that's always got me was how proud of you Lillian was. My son's in America, doing ever so well, she'd say to anyone who asked about you. Isn't that right, Mason? Yes, she'd often come out with happy memories of your childhood. She must have found it very hard that you never got in touch, but she never showed it. So how come you didn't come back at the end of your holiday to America when you were a student? I've often wondered. If you're expecting something original, you're going to be disappointed. I met a girl. Jerry and I had been traveling around for a month or so, and we fell in with this bunch of hippies. We were running low on funds, and they were kind to us, beating us and letting us crash in this squat they were occupying in Monterey. There was this girl in the group. I'd never met anyone like her. She had Native American blood in her, long black hair down to her waist, and the deepest blue eyes you ever saw. You could drown in them. And her teeth were like stars, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, you're such a comedian. She took a fancy to me. God knows why. We got together. And I was just so into her that when it was time to leave, well, there was no contest. We stayed together about six months, but she was a free spirit. She went off to Canada to look for her native ancestors. And she'd probably have come home then but it would have seemed like admitting defeat. So I just stayed. And the longer it went on, the harder it got to break the habit. So without any consideration for your parents, or my dad who'd helped you get there in the first place, or me for that matter, you just couldn't be bothered to come back. Or, or rise and explain even. It just wouldn't have entered that thick, self-centered skull of yours. Look. I know you see me as the bad guy in this scenario. And if I could turn back the clock, I guess I'd do things differently. We could all say that. But what's done is done. And I don't need any extra help being reminded what a heel I was. Thank you very much. Well, I'll leave you to wrestle with your conscience, assuming you've still got one. I'd better be making tracks. Obviously, you're free to stay here until such time as the authorities decide what's to happen to the house. I suggested it would be a good idea to make an appointment with Alex Powell and discuss the situation with him. Whatever. I don't see any necessity for us to communicate directly. We can do it through the solicitor. That's what we pay him for, after all. Thanks for everything, Mason. You've been a tower of strength. No, it was nothing, really. Goodbye, Scott. I can't say it's been a pleasure seeing you again after all these years. You mealy-mouthed scumbag. 
Where do you get off with all this holier-than-thou crap? From what I've been hearing, you weren't exactly much of a son to Lillian over the years. One of the neighbours I talked to after the funeral told me you never once invited her to stay with you in St. Albans, and you rarely came to visit here. And don't pull that, I was too busy with my job and family, bullshit. Then when she moved into the home, it was Mason here who did the visiting and the caring. Yes, he is a tower of strength. I take my hat off to him. In fact, if anybody deserved a piece of this place, it's him. He's been more of a son to Lillian than either of us. Don't go dragging me into your family feud. Whatever I did for Lillian, it was as a friend. And certainly never with the intention of material gain. Of course not. I wasn't suggesting that. I was merely pointing out that you show great... What's the word? Altruism. And that you deserve some sort of recognition. Unlike me and Andrew over there, who've been so derelict in our filial duty. Okay. So maybe I wasn't as attentive as I should have been. But at least I stayed in touch, unlike you. And she wasn't even my real mother. Ah, now we get to it. She took you on as her own son when she married your dad. She cared for you. She nurtured you. Oh, yes. She looked after me until I was old enough to stand on my own two feet. But she didn't love me. Not really. I always felt it. She only loved you. Then, when Dad died, she gave up the pretense of caring for me. All that time, she'd been pining for you. But you never came. And now it's too late. I'll um, just come and say goodbye to Maureen and wave you off. Sayonara, Andrew. Hurry back. Ah, oh, that's better. To start thinking about your future, Scott. Beginning with fixing up this place. Wallpaper will have to go. And the painting. Last tasting art was always eccentric, to say the least. Oh, I see you're admiring Lillian's handiwork. What? Yes, she painted that. Uh, she started attending art classes at the college. Really enjoyed them. Uh, she never rated herself, but I think that's rather good. I love colours. If I were allowed anything of hers, it would be that. Take it. No, I, I couldn't possibly. No, I couldn't possibly. Take it. You deserve it. Thank you. I shall treasure it. Uh, naturally, there will be a fee. No such thing as a free lunch. Oh, of course. Uh, my wallet's in the car. I'll just go and get it. <laughs> I can get you any time. I don't want your money. But, given my current financial situation, a few more free breakfasts wouldn't go amiss, if I may trespass further upon your goodwill. I think we can manage that. I'll even throw a few eggs over easy into the bargain. Are you for real? One for the road? No, thanks. I, I'd better be off soon. What are your plans, then? Will you be all right here? You can always skip down at my place. Thanks, but I want to stay on here as long as I can. I'll try and find some work, I guess. I can turn my hand to most things. My resume reads like the yellow pages. <laughs> I'll try and make this place a bit more habitable and see what happens. They sell the roof from over my head. I guess I'll be on the move again. Now it's the nearest thing to a home I have. So I want to make the most of it. Be it ever so humble and all that. Plus, I can still feel Lillian's spirit here. So I guess I better try and make my peace with her. <laughs> better late than never. Of course. I have to be up and out early tomorrow, but... I'll look in on you in the evening, if that's agreeable. Very agreeable. Good night. And thanks again, Mr. Tower of Strength. <laughs> You're welcome. Good night. Well, Ma, 
This is just you and me now. Vacant Possession by Nigel Banks. Scott was played by Nigel Banks. Andrew by Mike Aries. And Mason by Patrick O'Connor. Sound effects and editing were by Robbie Burgess with additional sound effects from Rebecca Williams. The play was produced by Nigel Banks and this was an old Dolly production. <laughs>